Jake and I kind of got busy elsewhere, but uh, I, I just couldn't couldn't go on without having a show with Jake again here. So, so I, I know, oh, sweetie. <laughs> And we've got uh, a couple of our, our absolute favorite um, guests here. And oops, I cannot do. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, anyway, sorry. It's not letting me. It's it, it's being weird. It's being weird. But um, tonight we are going to cover healers, psychopomps, and spirits um, with our with our good friends Ramon Delgado and Brandon Weston. Um, let me. I'll just give a brief little introductory summary on them and, and then we can jump right in. Um, Brandon Weston is a spiritual healer, medium and writer living in the Arkansas mountains, the, the Ozarks. Um, he's the author of Ozark Folk Magic, Plants, Prayers and Healing and uh, the Ozark Mountain Spellbook. He's the owner of Ozark Healing Traditions, a collective of articles, lectures, and workshops focusing on traditions of medicine, magic, and folklore from the Ozark Mountain region. As an active spiritual healer, his work with clients includes everything from cleanses to house blessings, from exorcisms to spirit elevations, and all the weird and wonderful ailments in between. He comes from a long line of Ozark Hill folk and works hard to keep the traditions he's collected alive and true for generations to come. And Jake can drop his website uh, there in, in the chat if you don't mind, Jake. And get a hold of him uh, on Instagram at, at Ozark Healing Traditions. And then another sweetheart and favorite is Roman Delgado. Ramon is a shamanic healer, a shamanic practitioner. Um, he has a strong background in brujeria, curandis, curandirismo, curandirismo. I'll let you say that here in a minute, Ramon. Um, <laughs> Southern conjure and many forms of spiritual healing. He has associate's degrees in Wiccan ministry from Wolstein Theological Seminary and is a seeker in the ATC wise tradition of Wicca, studying under Daryl and Rebecca Delf of the Evergreen Hearth ATC. Um, to learn more about Ramon and his work, visit his web website at www.teotitonalli.com. -T 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 -O -T -O Tonali, I believe it's pronounced. And with that, shall we jump on in, guys? Let's jump in. Yay! Fantastic. Uh, welcome back. Um, it, it's been a little while for both of you and, and for us as well. We, I needed a, a hiatus and Jake was, I think, also feeling a little bit of the stresses going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jake with his facial expressions there. <laughs> but um, where would y'all like to start the, the discussion this evening? I just I thought it would be fun to get the the different aspects, um, uh, Ramon's background as opposed to Brandon's background, and and just learn more about crossing spirits over and maybe mediumship and and healing of the spirits if, if they're having troubles crossing over and and you know all those fun things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I'll let Ramon uh, start. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I imagine that we probably have a lot in common, probably more in common in what we do than what uh, than the differences. I bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my start got started in childhood. I've always had a natural knack to connect with spirits. You know, when I was a little boy, I got in a lot of trouble for not knowing the difference between the living and the dead. Oh. Uh, my grandmother was a curandera. She was a healer. Uh, my entire mother's side of the family, most of my elders were practitioners of brujería, which is sorcery. It's magic. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was my first teacher. So she's the one who taught me to pray. She's the one who taught me to work with the spirits. She's the one who taught me to, to do the basic healing work that is the foundational aspects of my practice. Um, my main aspect of working with spirits, however, comes from my training in core shamanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I've been training in for several years now. Oh, I knew that. 
Um, go, Brandon. Oh, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> my <Sorry>. background, <laughs> you're good. Uh, my background is, you know, uh, Ozark traditional healing and folk magic, um, which uh, also has, you know, a lot of different cultural things wrapped up into that, um, that we've talked about before. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, there are even influences from Kurundarismo in, in the Ozarks here. Um, especially now, um, we have uh, a lot of Curanderos and practitioners here in the area now. Um, and so my background was, you know, a little bit of family tradition, but I really didn't um, really didn't get exposed to the folk magic and healing until later um, when I started interviewing and, and meeting with Ozarkers from around the region and collecting things. And uh, during that process, got identified as somebody with a gift and then started collecting things for my own practice then um, to actually be able to help people. Um, the spirit work that I do kind of came hand in hand with that. Um, I mean, remembering back to childhood, I had very similar experiences about, you know, being in the woods, talking to fairies and spirits and things like that, and uh, not really thinking anything of it. And coming from an Ozark family, you know, there's a lot of these folk beliefs, a lot of these traditional beliefs that are still in the family um, and still amongst, you know, older generations of, of Ozarkers. And so they didn't really think of any anything of it either. <laughs> so it's, you know, if you come up and you start talking about how you had an experience with the little people in the forest, uh, you know, old people are sometimes just going to say, you know, like, well, be careful. Uh, don't, you know, don't make any deals with them and, and just keep an eye on it. <laughs> or, you know, if you, if you are, you know, feel a, a spirit or see a dead loved one or something like that, um, it's interesting the, the culture still to this day doesn't really brush that off it's just like oh that's superstition we don't talk about that no in the ozarks you know there are lots of families that still you know look for omens and tokens after a person has died to symbolize them going to heaven or looking for you know tokens that perhaps they're a wandering spirit or that they are restless things like that and so it's still a, a part of the culture today and luckily i grew up with a family that um you know didn't necessarily encourage spirit mediumship and stuff like that, but they encouraged at least um, exploring the gift, um, exploring the sort of uh, leaning towards maybe having um, some experience with the other world. Um, so it really didn't solidify in me until later when I started meeting um, practitioners who did a lot of spirit work. Um, as a part of their practice. And then uh, sort of light bulbs went off and, you know, I thought, oh, these experiences that I had were actual, uh, actual experiences. They weren't just me being crazy. Cool. Um, <laughs> so then I started, you know, training a little bit more with practitioners who do a lot of spirit work. Uh, one of the teachers that I had introduced me to what she called a kinder exorcism, which essentially was based in, um, you know, spiritism and spiritualism, where the spirits around us aren't kicked out, they're not hurt, they're not trapped, like the old sort of techniques of exorcism. Um, she was all about ministering to spirits and helping them heal and cross over or elevate, things like that. Um, so that was a very interesting path to take um, because in traditional Ozark folk magic, so much of the spirit work is based in the sort of here are the methods to drive out a spirit or to trap a spirit or to, you know, kick a spirit out of your house. And so um, I have those methods as well as the methods that are really true to my heart, which are the, the methods of healing for the, for the spirits, things like that. You know, and it's a really interesting thing because I was just talking about this to a class I literally just finished teaching right before I got home. Uh, and it's the energy of a lot of the times when we're dealing with uh, deep possession with uh, crossing spirits over. A lot of us fail to understand that a lot of these entities that we're dealing with are not necessarily evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're simply right. out of place, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, human beings who are, example, attached to someone, you know, even though they may have been toxic when they're left, that doesn't make them evil. It's just that they don't belong in the world of the living. You know, they need to be in the afterlife. When we're dealing with spirits of nature, you know, have a spirit of nature attached to someone doing harm, 
is it's not that they are evil and doing harm, it's just that they are out of place, you know? Just because a, uh, a ladybug is beautiful doesn't mean it belongs where your liver should be. Right. <laughs> So I said that a lot about my classes. And even when we're dealing with spirits who religions speak them as being dark or evil or harmful, carry that same energy. Think about this energy of the lore of demonology, okay? When we're dealing with dark spirits, if you think about them from the perspective of their home dimension, where they were created, live and do their work, what they do in everyday life and their energy is perfectly in place and perfectly normal and needed where they work. However, when you get them out of their natural habitat into this world that is the world of, of the living, that's when harm starts to come about. And when I do my work, one of the things that I've been learning more recently, it is the energy of respecting that, but also respecting the autonomy of the spirits It's saying, hey, do you wanna go home? You know, because they're dreaming their own dreams. Their reality and our reality may not be the same. So when we're encountering spirits, we need to remember they may be in a completely different mindset and in a completely different perception of reality than you. It doesn't make them evil. It simply means that they are out of place and they are thinking differently than you. And because of that, when we meet, our dreams collide. Yeah, right. I agree. Completely agree with that. And yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely something that I try to get across to the people that I work with, too, is that, you know, experience of, of spiritual energies and things like that, uh, from our perspective might might be very harmful or scary for us, but even spirits that are just sort of earthbound spirits that are sort of working through these, you know, cycles of, of memories and things like that, even so our perception of that, I mean, we have very specific fears surrounding that, but they, they don't perceive it the same way. And so you have to approach it. You have to approach these spiritual forces kind of where they are. Um, yeah. I like to say, you know, there, there, in my practice, there are no demons in the, the sort of traditional sense. There are only spirits that are ignorant of their actions or ignorant of their purpose or the purpose of the, the soul in general. Um, and so what we do through the, the sort of elevation process or the exorcism process is trying to wake up spirits to their purpose or try to plant seeds that, you know, will eventually grow into something. Um, and through that, you know, not only helping the spirits that are disembodied, but also helping the embodied spirits too. So a lot of what I do is going into homes and places where um, I will do most of my work counseling the living people that are in the home. And then if there are these other spiritual energies around, I will also work on that. But I find, you know, probably seven times out of 10 that a lot of the issues are with the, the embodied inhabitants in the place and not necessarily with the, the spiritual energies there. But yeah, a big thing about with Ozark folk practice and healing and folk magic both is this idea of returning to equilibrium. And so it, with the body that is out of equilibrium with the, the natural world, that is how disease comes in. That's how curses come in, things like that. And it's the same thing with the spirit world. So the spirit world that is out of balance with nature, the spirit world that is out of balance with us as a part of nature, um, you know, part of healing that is bringing all of this stuff back into a natural cycle and back into this sort of equilibrium. And then a lot of problems can be resolved um, specifically when we look at like nature spirits and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really interesting. I think, uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Wendy can remind me of this or not. We've done a podcast before about my work with ancestral healing, right? Yes. Yes. So people can look that back on, on your archives. Mm -hmm. But when it deals with my ancestral healing, when I'm dealing with that, a lot of the times um, I get working with the dead. And I'm gonna give an example for those who have not listened to the ancestral healing podcast. <laughs> um, and when I got started doing ancestral healing, um, I was doing readings, I was casting the bones, you know, folk magic from the South, that's very popular. 
So in one of those readings, a client of mine who was regular, they came up with this problem where they had every man in their family for the past 12 generations had passed away at the exact same age of the exact same illness, sometimes down to the very birthday. Okay. And, and I did not know how to deal with that. So I, I went into shamanic journey. I exited my body. I found one of the spirits that teaches me how to do things. And they go, and I go, well, how do I fix this? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. in the meantime, I gave her resources to find more experienced healers who could help them. Um, but that started me in my practice. And one thing that I have really, really interestingly found in this process is, is that uh, one of the number one things that is the issue in practice practices of ancestral time, that when the ancestors are not at rest, this is because they have never been forgiven for their toxicity. Mm-hmm. You know, in order for the dead who are toxic, who are in pain, who are angry, who are in a bad space of any type, particularly heavier, fiery emotions that create issues for everyone around them, they need to be let go by the living. If the living are still pissed off, 10 wells till Sunday, about the dead and what the dead did to them, they're not gonna cross over. And they're gonna be stuck living around their family in the world of the dead, getting angrier and angrier and more and more pain, creating more and more issues for the living. So one of the things that I have to do before I cross the spirits over is actually get permission from the living. It says, are you ready to let the dead go? Are you ready to forgive? Otherwise the the healing cannot take place. Because that's an interesting energy is, is that As we go through this uh, podcast, we're gonna be talking about this in more depth, I think. It says that there are aspects of healing that the dead need that they cannot have for themselves unless they cross over or unless the living give it to them. And forgiveness is one of them. Until you forgive the people who have done you wrong, who have passed away, they're gonna live rent free inside your head. And that is not where they should be. They should be in the afterlife. Mm-hmm. So forgiveness is a, is a big part of uh, the even even the exorcisms that you're talking about, Brandon and and Ramon, and talking about freeing your own mind from it. That's that makes a lot of sense, a whole lot of sense. Now, um, would you like to give some uh, some examples of the 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 psychopomps that you use, the the entities that help spirits cross over to the afterlife? Either one of you is fine. I work very heavily with Archangel Gabriel. Okay. If you look at Catholic lore from uh, from uh, many years ago, you know, from heavily in the past, the Archangel Gabriel was tasked from uh, taking the souls of the dead from the de- dead from the deathbed into the afterlife. It is why in Victorian tradition and still in many Latin American countries, particularly in Mexico, uh, we believe that it takes about ten days for the soul to cross over. And it is why we still cover all of our mirrors with our cloths for 10 days. And we still wear our morning clothes for 10 days in a row. And we say the rosary three times a day for them, 10 days in a row, because we're praying that they get to the afterlife afterlife safety. Um, I've worked with Hermes in the past. I have worked with Anubis in the past. Uh, Another thing that is important to understand is working with protection. Because just because they die doesn't mean that they're saints. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> so sometimes you need someone by your side to just keep an eye out. So I work very heavily with Archangel Michael. I also work very heavily with Archangel Raphael to just help the healing process. Sweet. I tend to uh, I tend to bring in a lot of ancestral spirits, and what has helped me is in a situation where if it's, you know, if I'm dealing with somebody that I know the family, I can bring in the spirits of that family and the ancestral spirits specifically related to that person. But if I don't know where they came from or who they are, um, you know, everybody has a guardian spirit, you know, at least one. And most people have, you know, a ton that they don't even know about. And everybody has ancestral spirits that follow them around and help them. And so as a part of the work that I do, I usually will call in you know, even if I don't know their names, I will call in the ancestral spirits that want to see this spirit pass on and to elevate. Um, so the higher order spirits, according to you know spiritism. 
this idea that the higher order spirits by their nature of, of their evolution and the, you know, the goodness that they have had throughout their lives, um, the higher order spirits have this ability to act upon lower order spirits, anything that's below them. And so calling in a, like a guardian angel or a guardian spirit or an ancestral guardian to come in and to actually, you know, take the hand of the spirit that I'm working with and lead them into the sort of the spirit world or, or a rebirth or whatever it might be. And so for me, that helps the most. Sometimes I will get glimpses of certain things to work with. I was working in a house one time. Um, and it's very unusual around here to find places that are very heavily Catholic. Um, we do have pockets of Catholic uh, communities around here, but it's mostly Protestant, either from, you know, British Protestant or German Protestants as well came and settled in the area. And so I was in a house one time and they were dealing with some lots of bad dreams and things going on. And they felt like there was something there that was like trying to get in touch with them. So I just kind of came in to assess the situation. And I kept getting images of a rosary. I kept getting images of saints, specifically Saint Benedict. I got uh, images of Saint Patrick also. And so like I, I did just sort of an assessment of what was going on and um, really felt like the spirits that were sort of hanging around there were had been Catholic, specifically Irish Catholic because of the Saint Patrick. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just did some research and I brought in some novenas to, to St. Benedict and to St. Patrick and in, into the, the elevation process. And they, it comforted them um, because they were familiar with that. And so in that case, I used saints to come in and to help guide them into their, their next rebirth or into elevation. Um, so that happens quite a bit where I'll get, you know, a glimpse of an ancestral spirit that might've been with them. And I can actually sort of visualize that energy coming in, or I'll get a glimpse of an angel like Gabriel or Michael, or I'll get a glimpse sometimes just, you know, of Mary. And so I'll bring in those energies. Um, and so the way I work is tends to not be very formulaic. I, I actually really enjoy just sort of walking into a space, not knowing what's going to go on and just sort of uh, say, okay, yeah, surprise. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. it, I, I found that that's a very traditional Ozark way of working is like, you know, you never know what you're going to come against, but I've got my guides, my guardians, my patrons surrounding and protecting me. I'll go into a space and just whatever I encounter, I, I'm prepared to encounter it because, you know, the, the, I've got the beings around me that are helping me to do that. So and that's a really good bridge between Ozark and folk uh, traditions and folk magics and, um, and shamanic work. You know, the energy of the helper spirits, you know, the spirits that, that have your back and do the work through you and with you. Uh, I work a lot with power animals and I have my power animals assist me through the process. I would work a lot with something worth it. But one of the things that is a little bit different in my work is, is that in most of the situations, even though I do have the saints and the uh, power animals and, and the angels working with me, I tend to be the psychopomp because in shamanic healing, that's what we do. You know, I go into trance with my drum or with my rattle and I find a spirit that is either attached to the house or to the land or to the person or to the object. And I introduce myself and I ask them, you know, are you happy here? Are you, and they say, well, yes, well, okay. You, are you, you're not doing harm, you can stay, you know? Because we don't always cross them over if they don't want to, if they're not doing harm. But if they're creating ruckus, we try to make sure that we educate them that you are, you know, you're, you're harming people without wanting to or you're harming them more than you thought. Mm -hmm. and then we take them to where they need to be. I literally grab them by the hand and find the, I ask my helper spirits, where do they belong uh, or my power animals? And we go to where they belong and we make sure that they're welcome there and we leave them there. And that's, that's actually quite an interesting way of working with them that I've been developing throughout the years. I mean, my initial training, there were some situations in which uh, more like uh, Brandon was saying about working with the ancestral spirits. I had spirits in the past who did not want to cross over. And then my helper spirit says, tell them about, let's say their mother or their wife or their brother, you know? 
And they say, can I see them again? And the helper spirits and me, we would take them to the, to the level, to the place within the afterlife where those family members were. And then they were easier to release the, the, the middle world, the plane of the living. Okay. So they were like, oh, now I can go. I'm, I'm happier going now that I have them with, you know? And it's a, it's a very visceral thing when I'm doing my, my sacrum work for my clients. You know, in shamanic killing, most of my clients don't feel much, you know? I tell my clients that it's a lot like doing surgery, shamanic killing. You know, you're knocked out during the surgery. You, you rarely feel anything. It is afterwards that it gets intense in the, in the integration process. Mm -hmm. But the one portion of the healing when they do need it and they have it is the sacrum work. They always feel something. I have clients telling me in the past that they felt like somebody was touching them. And when, when I finished crossing them over, they felt the release, like, like the arm that was being grabbing them, let them go. I had clients that started crying profusely because in their own way, they felt the dead leave. I had clients that said that they, they had a vision of the heavens opening up, receiving their loved ones. And it's always so visceral for them and it's so healing for the living, because a lot of the times the living don't fully realize how much the dead can influence the well-being of the world of the living when they no longer belong here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point uh, because I, I was just thinking about that. This this idea of you know people don't realize how how integrated the the spirit world and us as embodied spirits are that like we need to be in that in in balance and equilibrium with each other as well as you know the spirit world being in, in balance and equilibrium with itself and so going into um you know ha hauntings and, and things like that i always tell the the living residents that they are equally as part of this um that you know i think sometimes we just think of ourselves as sort of observers of the other world um, but traditionally in the Ozarks, there is this very, you know, firm idea that the other world is a mirror image of this wor world and it's constantly on top of this world. And so at any given time, we're surrounded by the spirits that have always been around us <laughs> and that have been on the land. And so, you know, we're just like you know, over the centuries, we've lost our connection with nature. We see ourselves as apart from nature. We've lost our connection with the other world, the spirit world too. Uh, we think of ourselves as being separate from that. But, and I think that causes a lot of problems like hauntings and, and things like that, where we're out of balance with that, that other place. We're out of balance with those spirits. Whereas maybe at one point in our ancestry, we would have had a, a much closer relationship to the spirit world. And so when problems arose, we would maybe have a natural solution that we, we just knew to do. Um, so, you know, if the ancestors were upset with us and we all got sick from that, then we would know the things to do to, to write that relationship or to, to help that relationship or to bring that balance back. And I think that's what we struggle with today is not knowing what to do. And I think a lot of the people that reach out to me for help, they, they just, they don't know what to do. They have no concept of even what to do. And so when I come in and say, you know, did, did you have a bad relationship with a near ancestor that is now passed? And they say, oh yeah, I had a horrible relationship with my mother who passed away three months ago. And then I say, well, do you think that this might be contributing to the, the issues that you're having in the home? And so I think that, um, a lot of what I do is, like I said earlier, sort of counseling the living to sort of bring these traditional ideas back up so they start thinking about, you know, their relationship to their ancestors and their relationship to the spirit world. And then after we sort of establish that, then we can start talking about the ghost that's in the house right now <laughs> or the spiritual energy that's in the house right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's one of those things that we've kind of lost, but that we're they're trying to regain again or build up in, in some way. Well, you know, the things that you just said brought up a whole bunch of other things for me. And that is the distinction between a discarnate spirit, a spirit of the dead and an ancestor. You know, the ancestors for me personally are those who lived well and died well, and those who are at peace in the afterlife, you know? 
in my traditions that I follow, we don't acknowledge them as ancestors until they are in the afterlife and they process their life and they are in a better place than the residents. Um, we treat those who are stuck here as normal people, you know, the dead are people too, you know, until they cross over. Mm-hmm. So that's an, an interesting way of looking at things. But another thing that comes across here as well is, is that when it comes to being psychopomps and healers, we're not just dealing with the energies of the dead, we're also dealing with the energy of the spirits of the land. You know, and they've been situations, mm-hmm. I don't know, for you, Brandon, when I've been called to a healing or a, a haunting, and the issue was not a dead spirit or a human being. It was literally a spirit of the land who had been in pain for the desecration of their sacred space for so long and in so much pain and in so much anger and rage about being disrespected that they were twisted out of shape by those heavy emotions and they became toxic. And part of my work was doing healing for that spirit of the land and returning them to health and well-being and teaching the people in that property how to properly honor the spirits of the land like that they would not continue to have a uh, have a haunting uh, in their home that has more to do with the way the land be, was being treated than any ghost. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Uh, this this idea uh, from an Ozark perspective, you know, the the spirits of the dead. That's one very small percentage of the inhabitants of the other world or of the spirit world. And so, yeah, traditionally in in Ozark folk practice, we have. Um, a lot of different methods for sort of determining what type of spirit we're dealing with. I typically always do um, a divination session before I do any spirit work. I, I use geomancy personally because I think it, it is, for me, been one of the easiest ways to be able to sort of in, interact with the, my guides, my guardian spirits through a divination method. Um, but that's what I always start with to be, to be able to see, is this, uh, is this a person that has passed on and their spirit is now, you know, trapped? Is this an earthbound spirit? Is this a spirit who hasn't been human yet? Um, is this an animal spirit? Is this a land spirit? Is this one of the little people or another fae being? Is this, you know, so we have a whole lot of different sort of things that it could possibly be. And yeah, there have definitely been situations where I've had people call me and say, hey, we have a ghost. And I immediately am like, okay, well, we'll see about that. Uh, and, so I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then I go in and I, I do a geomancy reading and I'm like, well, it's not actually a ghost like you're thinking it's it's a land spirit that has been offended by something that's going on and that action needs to be righted in order for this spirit to not be enraged by what you're doing here um and so yeah that happens quite a bit um and and just sort of explaining to people that you know not all spiritual entities are ghosts um it doesn't help that traditionally Ozarkers, um, because we've kind of had to protect a lot of our stuff under the guise of Christianity, um, a lot of the language sort of makes it confusing too. So I've still encountered old timers who refer to all of these different beings as angels. So even fairy beings, even uh, beings, oddly enough, even beings that are tricksters can sometimes be referred to as angels, trickster angels, things like that. Or sometimes they're all referred to as spirit, um, which makes it kind of confusing when you're going through and saying, well, the umbrella is spirit, but underneath it is all of these different types. And um, that has been interesting for me and my sort of learning process is, you know, when I go into a situation, I'm, I'm never quite sure what type of spirit I'm dealing with. And each and every one of these types has, you know, different things that they like and dislike and different ways of helping them. And so, 
uh, I find it kind of interesting and I always teach my students like you have to have a good memory for this stuff because you always have to be able to sort of compile all of this stuff and keep it around because you might encounter this same type of spirit later on and then you'll know how to deal with it or you'll have a better idea of what to start with with these different types of spirits. Um, land spirits, the I, I would say the the spiritual entities that I encountered the most here in the Ozark Mountains, um, ghosts, uh, you know, departed, recently, uh, you know, embodied spirits, um, that that type of energy I I encounter a lot, and then land spirits, and then the little people. Um, because the little people are everywhere and they are <laughs> often uh, um, can be very protective, but can also be very sort of tricky. And uh, when you have an area like this that is very ancient and very, um, very closely connected to lots of powerful land features and you have urbanization going on um, people are constantly coming face to face with the little people and there's a lot of problems that result from that sort of interaction so um, a lot of times when i get called to a place um, it's it's for something from the little people <laughs> Well, you know, and that brings up a point that is very interesting for people who are listening, who are thinking about contacting a spirit worker to cleanse their home or a person of the house. You know, and for me personally, if you encounter a spirit working and they walk into your house or they look at your, at your, uh, at your person that needs help and within two seconds, they tell you what's wrong with them. For me, that's a red flag because this kind of work is so much more complex than just uh, a clairvoyant uh, expression of what's happening. You know, we need to understand the complexity of the situation. I think um, when we did our soul level illness, uh, Wendy, we talked about how illness never stands alone. Mm -hmm. By the way, I still have that podcast embedded on my website. Oh, for fantastic. My clients, yeah. <laughs> for my clients to, to, to understand what I do better and they love mm -hmm. it. Oh, anyway, besides the also, <laughs> but it never stands alone. You have those, whether it's for the living or for the dead, for physical or for spirit, or even for the land. So when we stand in a place and we just go, oh, that's the problem, we're only looking at the tip of the iceberg. You know, mm -hmm. when you have an, a skilled and experienced healer, yes, we look at the, the tip of the iceberg, but we need to have the sanity and clarity of, of spirit to delve beneath the surface and see the true root of the problem. You know, this is why in the South and including some parts of the Ozarks, a lot of this work is called root work because we mm -hmm. doctor the root of the soul. That's another word for Southern conjure. It's called root work. Not just because we work with roots and oils and candles and herbs and all of that, because we doctor the root of the soul and not only the soul of the living, but the souls of the dead, and the land, and all of our clients. It's the energy of doctoring the very essence of who needs help in any time necessary. And a lot of the times it's not as simple as, oh, yes, you have this problem, you know. It could be that somebody offended the land or that the land, you know, or in the case of ancestral healing is, is yes, this person was toxic and they're stuck in the world of the living, but the issue is, is that you have 10 generations of them that are still pissed off at them <laughs> and they won't let him go. Mm -hmm. Now that's a perfect example of that. Illness never stands alone. And as healers, you need a healer who's willing beyond their initial impression and get the full picture to understand the full extent of the illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, from an Ozark perspective, um, just to mention quickly about that. So with the healing process, um, everything, yeah, illness is so much more complicated than it just is on the surface with surface level symptoms, things like that. And within Ozark healing theory, we, we are very strongly connected to the Zodiac signs still. So the Zodiac cycles and the moon cycles, things like that. And so within the body, you know, the Zodiac houses are represented from the head down to the feet, um, each house is represented in the body. And so when somebody is looking for an illness, even within an embodied person or within a spirit, you have 12 different houses 
to consider um, as a part of the diagnosis process. And that's for the living and for the dead. And so, yeah, complexity, yes. Um, these, these illnesses and things, even for spirits, you know, can be sitting in one of these 12 houses within their body. And, you know, if we, if we don't know how to be able to locate those things, um, lots of illnesses and curses and things can move throughout the body. And so, yeah, a lot of the basis for Ozark folk healing looks at those 12 houses. And then by extension, spirit work, we look at the sort of 12 houses represented within the spirit to get a full picture of past, present, and even future of a spirit uh, to be able to see exactly where we need to work um, and what we need to address. So yeah, I agree with that completely that, um, yeah, if you go to a spirit worker and they just sort of rattle off an answer immediately, maybe question them a little bit. <laughs> um, and just to go along with that, um, people always sort of ask me, people that are interested in doing sort of spirit work stuff, what my, you know, one of my suggestions for getting started is, and I always suggest get in touch with divination first, um, because divination is such an important part of my spirit practice from an Ozark perspective. Divination, especially a very complex divination system like geomancy that relies upon the 12 houses of the zodiac, um, it's going to give you so much better pic picture and so much deeper picture of the situation than if you were just going to go in relying on intuition alone. And I use a lot of intuition and I use a lot of sort of feeling from my spirit guides and guardians, things like that. But I always verify that with a, a divinatory system. Um, there were two questions posted. Do you want to hold off on questions till after or or go with them as they're popping up i'm fine going with them when they pop up yeah let's go with them as they pop up okay then you give us more things to th talk about yeah <laughs> uh let's see oh there it is you want me to get it or you want me to ask or yeah yeah that'd be great jake okay so folks we got what are the differences between little people from say a european background and Native American or Latin American? Are there differences? So from an Ozark perspective, um, Ozark little people, it, it's, a, it's a true sort of American tradition in that it is an amalgam. It's a mixture of both European and indigenous traditions. So there's a lot of um, indigenous European folk beliefs surrounding fairies um, by lots of different names. Those all, both from, you know, Northern Europe, as well as from sort of the Celtic countries, um, all of that came over to America with white settlers. And specifically, you know, if we're looking at the Ozarks, um, in Appalachia, this sort of European folk knowledge mixed and mingled with both indigenous uh, Southeastern folk knowledge as well as West and Central African folk knowledge too. And so you can say the, the Ozark approach to the little people is a, a really good representation of both uh, of Europe, of Africa and indigenous America as well. Um, so yeah, I get that a lot uh, because the Ozarkers, we still refer to them as the little people. And um, I know the Cherokee say little people, I think the Muscogee Creek say little people as well. And so I, I get that question a lot from people is, you know, are, are the Ozarkers just, you know, taking the indigenous little people and, and mm -hmm. no, <laughs> this is, uh, we refer to them as little people. It's a, it's a true sort of American amalgam tradition. Um, um, of a lot of different folk beliefs from a lot of different places. Um, and I will say, I mean, the, the Ozark and Appalachian approach to the, the little people is pretty unique as far as like fairy beliefs go in America. Um, there is a lot of very interesting variations on uh, the folk beliefs surrounding the little people here. Okay. And Roman, when it comes to say Latin America, um, how, how does... Could you describe it? Well, in uh, my part of the world, when my ancestry comes from and where I spent some time living, uh, there's very little mention of the little people. Hmm. What we have very commonly is the influence of the Spanish. 
Okay. The Spaniards brought their own lore uh, about the spirits of the land. Uh, a good example of that would be uh, spirits surrounding uh, old trees. You know, mm -hmm. there is this very common uh, superstition, a knowledge that has been hidden beneath the superstition about a spirit we call a duende, which is basically a tree spirit. I'm going to tell you a story about that because we have time. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Duendes were believed in Mexico to, if you disrespect the, the tree that they were guarding, to steal the soul of the person in, uh, in culprit of this, that disrespect and kill them. So many years ago, when I was a small boy, a young man contracted me to go get some beer for him and his friends to eat at the park, to drink at the park. You know, they were getting drunk at the park. So there I go, when I finish, I give him this beer. And there's this very ancient avocado tree in one of the corners of the park. And um, we all knew that a duende lived in that, that tree. We did not go there on the night of the full moon or the night of the new moon when the energies were peaking. Okay. And he started just being boisterous and disrespectful and drunk, basically drunk. Mm -hmm. And we all saw two red eyes glowing about many yards away from the tree. And we all turned away and didn't look and did not engage the, that energy. He mm -hmm. did. The second he saw those eyes and they connected, he screamed and dropped dead as a doornail. Oh my gosh. And oh, his mother, their house was adjacent to the park. So she was watching all of this through the window. She screamed this blood curly scream for her son and came running down and wrapped him in a shawl, got her rosary and started praying to the, ros uh, the rosary to him, praying the rosary to God to bring her back her baby, to bring her back her baby boy, her son, which he was a grown man by now, but understandably so. <laughs> and the more she prayed, the more the wind picked up. Okay, the more it started to storm and there started to be lightning and rain and all of this. And by the time she finished the rosary, he opened his eyes and took a deep breath, almost like he had been drowning. Oh my word. And I told this story to a very prominent author in fairy magic that I met at a festival. And then she, he stopped and he said, Roman, this has nothing to do with the rosary she was praying. And then he goes, the, the little people, understood the mother's pain. Mm -hmm. And it was her mother's pain, her love for her child, the love in her heart that saved his life. Mm -hmm. That's a good that's story. A, that, that's a really good story, yeah. I don't know if um, Brandon has anything to say and an insight on that story. Well, I mean, yeah, there are so many Ozark type, oh, that type of story. It's always very exciting and interesting for me to hear stuff like that. Uh, I mean, yeah, so in the Ozarks, we uh, are a uh, heavily forested place. And it, so trees in particular have always been protected by Ozarkers, especially those that live out in the hills. Um, you don't chop down fruit trees. You don't chop oh. down trees that produce, you know, things that you might eat from, but also you don't chop down um, oak trees and ancient, you know, just big trees, sycamore trees or ghost trees. So you don't chop them down because they have these spirits attached to them. And so, yeah, there's lots of that sort of similar tree lore here. And the little people are known as protectors of nature uh, amongst all of the different types of sort of fairy beings that are here. The little people are the most protective. And yeah, I, I met a guy once, um, he, the, his family had owned some, uh, a big piece of land in the Ozarks for many generations. And his, one of his uncles, when he was so when this guy was a kid one of his uncles plugged up a natural spring on the land um, because they wanted to make more farmland and this spring was in the way and flooding the area so they dammed it up they rocked it up and um, he said his uncle right after that got sick and got sicker and got sicker mm. and they couldn't figure out why and um, so finally, they talked to somebody who knew things, uh, a gifted person in the, the area, and that person said that they had to go rebuild the spring or else the little people would kill him. And the uncle didn't believe it. The family didn't really believe it. So they didn't, they didn't build up the spring and the uncle died. Um, and from then on, that area 
um, never grew crops. Like they couldn't grow anything around that spring either. And so, oh, wow. yeah, there's lots of, lots of Ozark stories like that, where you just natural land features and, and auspicious locations, things like that. You just don't, I mean, everybody knows not to mess with them because the little people are protecting them. Oh, hot damn. Okay. Um, we have another question. Roman, do you want to add anything to that before I get to the next question? Well, you know, and it's interesting, just to close off that last story, shortly after that, the tree got chopped down, okay? Mm. That particular park was a members club for members, uh, people who worked in the railroad. Okay. Uh, within, a ye- within, I think, six months of the tree being chopped down, they cut the funding and the park closed. <laughs> the curse. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Wow. So the next question we have um, deals with root work. And the question is, because if you search for the topic of root work, it's heavily dominated by hoodoo. So how does that compare to, say, Santeria and Ozark folk magic? Um, I don't know. Roman, do you want to start? Yes. Okay. Okay. Santeria in particular is a religion that it is uh, based on the beliefs of the Yoruba people of Africa. It is the worship and work with the Orisha, okay? Uh, Root work as in its practice in the United States is not a religion, at least not in uh, uh, in the way I was taught and in the way my elders have taught me. Uh, Hoodoo and root work are the magical practices that came with people who were enslaved into the South that got mixed with Native American lore uh, Christianity and Catholicism, and then later Native American law. Yes, there is a lot of Christian spirituality built into it because the slaves were forced to convert to Christianity as part of their mm-hmm. indoctrination and the destruction of their culture. However, the practice itself is not always religious. It is not a religion. It is a magical system born out of the oppression of the enslaved people within the United States. And they have taken the number one tool that their enslavers had against them, which was the religion and found power in it and used it. A lot of root work and a lot of Southern conjure, we don't do incantations, we don't do spells, we don't do those type of things. Most woodworkers and most uh, conjure people, you will find it looking at a Bible verse for the power, for, for the prayer that we need to finish that working. And if you talk to the old timers, if you talk to the ones who uh, keep the wisdom from years ago, they will tell you that there is woodwork hidden in the Bible. There are actual woodworking works that you can learn by reading the Old Testament. Oh, and that wow. comes from my teacher directly in one, of our, in one of our talks together. You can learn root work by reading the Old Testament if that's what you want. And the thing that makes it confusing for people who think it's a religion, because old timers and the ones who keep the wisdom of the ancestors, not the people who learn from the internet or the books, they will openly tell you that you cannot take the Bible out of root work and out of hoodoo and still call it hoodoo, root work, or something conjuring. That is something completely new and different. Yes, it is powerful. It works. Uh, is not traditional voodoo, it's not traditional root work, and it's not traditional Southern conjure, which are all inter-exchangeable terms for the same thing. I don't know how that relates to Ozark traditions, but I would love to, to hear. Yeah, so I think um, I, get, I get this question a lot because a, a lot of people are familiar with Southern root work um, and they're seeing Ozark practice and Ozark practice is very similar to a lot of the things that are done within root work. And I would say that, you know, there are a lot of similarities because again, um, Ozarkers didn't just spring up out of the ground with this tradition. We come from Appalachia. Before that, we came from the East Coast, from Pennsylvania, German country. From before that, we came from, you know, across Europe, across across West Africa, Central Africa, Central Africa, a lot of different places. 
And so Ozark folk practice is an amalgam. And one of the things that it has amalgamated into the practice are indigenous practices as well as West African and Central African practices. You do find, um, so where I am in Arkansas, if you go south towards the river valley or east towards the Delta, you find what I like to call the borderland regions, which is where the Ozarks meet um, another culture. And specifically the river valley culture and the Delta culture is heavily, heavily influenced by Southern root work conjure. So if you've ever heard of Aunt Caroline Dye, who is probably one of the most famous hoodoos or conjure women, um, she's from Newport, Arkansas, which is just uh, about an hour and a half outside of the Ozarks. And so um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, there was a lot, a very heavy interaction between both the white culture as well as in pieces of indigenous culture and African culture that was, you know, forcibly brought here. Um, for about 30, 40 years, there were very, very important, there were about 12 or 13 important um, all Black communities in the Ozarks, and they were interacting with healers and folk practitioners here, um, trading knowledge, things like that, um, around, uh, you know, mid 1800s they were unfortunately destroyed um and you know these communities were driven to the river valley to the delta region and then up into missouri as well um, but pieces of that culture still remained within white ozark culture as well and so um i have friends who sort of have influence both from the ozark as well as from the southern root work and hoodoo culture as well um, but what i always tell people is that um, while we see the fingerprints of lots of different cultures within the Ozarks and within Ozark practice, we should recognize the fact that Ozark practice is its own thing, and hoodoo and Southern root work is its own thing, and we, we should respect them as their sort of own entities, their own practices and traditions, but there's lots of room for us to learn from each other and to sort of be able to compare, uh, which is kind of one of the things that I love to do is being able to say, oh my gosh, you do that too? We do that, <laughs> the same thing, mm -hmm. and it probably comes from the same origin, it probably comes from the same place. Um, so one, just real quick, one of the examples I always like to give is of red cedar, uh, which is uh, actually a juniper, Juniperus virginiana, eastern red cedar. It's such an important plant in the Ozarks. It's a cleansing plant, a healing plant. We smoke it um, to fumigate out, you know, negative energies, illnesses, all sorts of stuff. Um, Ozarkers, you know, by way of Germany, by way of the Highland regions in Scotland, they would have already had this love of juniper. If you go to German cult country part part of, uh, you know, Europe, um, the, the burning juniper as a fumigant is a very common thing. In the Highland areas of Scotland, it's a, it's a very common thing. But, the, you know, these people would have come already with probably bringing juniper with them um, as a healing plant, and they would have encountered red cedar, which is the American juniper, and they would have encountered indigenous people using red cedar in the same way that they had been using juniper. And so this is one of those areas where it's very exciting to sort of look at these two cultures uh, or more cultures that were using these same sorts of plants and then coming together and mixing their knowledge and, um, you know, making it into something else. Um, and so that's kind of, when you look at Ozark folk practice, it's full of stuff like that, uh, mm -hmm. where it's really hard to tell who influenced who, where did this come from? Um, because there's so many different pieces from so many different places that have just been brought together in this one tradition. You know, to jump deeper into this rabbit hole, because I love mm -hmm. rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> We're known for them. <laughs> every time we are uh, here in a podcast, we go into these rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very similar to brujería and curanderismo in, in Southern Conjure in the United States. Mexican brujería and curanderismo and Southern Conjure carry a lot of very similar elements because they have the influence of the enslaved people and the Catholicism from the Spanish and the native Mexican peoples. And one of the things that made me learn this on how we cross pollinate is not only going to the Mexican botanicas after learning more about conjure and going to the Mexican witchcraft store, which is called the botanica and seeing a lot of the things that you use in Southern conjure being sold at Mexican botanicas. However, 
some time ago, I was uh, on a phone call with one of my elders in Conjure. And I was telling her the story about when my mom got drunk and she was mean to me. I used to be like, I think five years old and I used to run like hell out of the house, go to the front yard and jump under the rose bushes. And okay. And if she tried to get me or grab me, she, the, the thorns of the rose bushes would have torn her to shreds, which I think uh, Brandon is kind of, the, 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 the gears are turning there. He knows where I'm going. Uh, <laughs> My grandmother planted those, those uh, um, rose bushes there, those rose plants there, years before when, the, when she first built the house. And my family kept telling her, why don't you put them in the back with the other plants where people won't steal your roses? And she would always said, you'll understand when you're older. <laughs> Being the curandera of the house. And a lot of the, the elders of the family who did learn from her, they would not ask. And then my elder, uh, just is, her name is Mama Star, Star Casas. She's written a whole bunch of books on, uh, on Conjure. And one of the things she tells us is, is that you plant rose bushes uh, by the entrance gate of your house. Number one, to bring in love by the roses, but also to protect it with the thorns. And that is that cross section, that cross pollination between cultures. Mm -hmm. There is a story of when I was a little kid, my grandmother used to teach me how to sweep the yard. You know, in the sweep south, in a lot of places, you sweep your backyard and you sweep it from back to front, always sweeping it out. And basically you're taking any tricks, any curses, anything that anybody has put in your house that is not good for you spiritually, you're sweeping it out of the house. Okay. And when I was a little boy, me and my cousin, my grandmother told us to sweep the yard and she was teaching us how. However, being tiny little kids, we figured out that we swept really half fast back and forth. It will make a huge cloud of dust. And it was really funny. <laughs> oh, well, no. our grandmother did not find it funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but she gave us a nice little spanking and she let us go play. You're not old enough to learn yet. Well, my teachers, one of my elders, again, has an almost identical story to mine saying, yeah. <laughs> I did the same thing when I was like, what was the look at? because it's all about sweeping it out. So when it comes to these folk traditions in the Americas in particular, there's such a huge cross pollination because as Brandon was saying, a lot of it comes from the same sources, the indigenous people of the Americas, the African slaves and Christianity. So there is this amalgamation of it that in the entirety of the, not only the folk magic practices, but the African diaspora traditions as well, is tends to be very similar. Yeah, just to comment on that, I have uh, I, I have my trailing uh, rose bushes uh, next to my front door <laughs> just for that. Um, okay. But we also, so I mean, one of the traditions that I have, um, so we have a plant here called Greenbrier. Uh, Smilax rotundifolia, uh, which is, it makes this really thick vine um, that's covered in thorns. And um, it, it, if it grows up in the forest, it's called a green briar hell. Um, because if you get stuck in it, you're, you're basically in hell in amongst <laughs> these vines and can't get out of it. Um, but if uh, there's a tradition that if a green briar grows up near your front door or near your front porch, you've got to let it trail um, and it'll protect your house. It'll protect the front porch. Um, so I had one pop up uh, just this last spring, actually. F finally, I've, I've been willing, you know, protect my house, protect my, and so one actually popped up near my front porch. And so I've got it sort of trailing up to where you can't step in it, but it's there <laughs> so that, you know, protect your house. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that um, old knowledge that we just sort of take as you know, oh, just something that grandma used to do, or, oh, that's just the, you know, the way you do things, but there was a purpose to it. Mm -hmm. And there, there was often both a surface level purpose, but then also um, a hidden magical level purpose or spiritual level purpose as well. You know, one of the things that I'm going to let out here that is like not very common knowledge in, in conjure communities and hoodoo, <laughs> unless you talk I'll let you talk to the old timers, you know, the ones that hold the knowledge. And this is something that I learned from one of my elders as well. Uh, and it's the energy of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Uncle Remus's stories, you know, the, the stories of Bray Rabbit and their friends, 
The reason they were told orally to the African-American community is because that's how they taught their children conjure. So most people don't know that. I've actually had dreams in which my ancestors were telling me how to handle a situation with conjure. Then the next day I'm thumbing through the stories of Uncle Remus and Rare Rabbit. And that same working is embedded into one of the stories I just read. A good example of that is the story, you know, that Disney made into the movie when he gets, Rare Rabbit gets stuck in the car, right? Mm-hmm. And he's t- telling the wall, please don't tell me to throw him into the briar patch. Please don't throw him, throw him into the briar patch. Anything but the briar patch is right, right. horrible, right? Mm-hmm. And what happened is, is that, okay, fine, I'll throw you into the briar patch so you'll suffer. And then he goes, you're, you're so, you know, you basically call him a fool and says, I live here. And the thing is, is that in conjure, briar is used for protection. And the, the, uh, the tar that there was being used, molasses and tar is normally used to nail down your enemies in conjure. You know, they, as, the prior, uh, as the molasses or the tar dries and it hardens, it immobilizes them and it makes them incapable of harming you. So there is a whole uh, conjure work embedded not only into the story, but into the Disney movie that most people don't know. Mm-hmm. Sweet. And if you if you want to go even deeper, there's actually so the Cherokee have their own rabbit stories and, and animal stories. And so um, in Cherokee folklore, Chistu is is the rabbit that that is the trickster, um, but also the the conjurer, the magician. Um, and they, there's a lot of very interesting crossovers with indigenous uh, briar, sort of chistu rabbit stories and briar rabbit stories that came from West and Central Africa. Um, and it also sort of merges into with uh, Aesop with the sort of Greek uh, animal stories as well. It's very interesting, the sort of cross-cultural um, variations that you have with, with those animal stories. And yeah, there's this, this idea of you know, storytelling always has um, an outer level and an inner level. And the outer level is, you know, entertainment. Um, Sometimes, you know, the outer level is cautionary tales, you know, making sure that, you know, people aren't, you know, doing this or that or getting hurt or whatever. Um, But then there's always this inner level too. these these sort of uh, secret messages to impart um, for those that have the gift to be able to parse it out or to be able to remember it. Um, yeah, and I find that in the Ozarks, a lot of our stories about the little people are like that, where on the outside, it's sort of humorous or, or cautionary tales, but underneath it, it sort of gives you um, tips and tricks about how to work with, uh, with these types of energies and spirits. Um, so you pick up on it without really even knowing you're picking up on it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we lost Jacob for a moment, but I think we continued... I, th- I think the broadcast continued. I think it just switched yeah. over to, to mine. So yeah, so my computer definitely did not like running Zoom Live with four participants and Final Cut Pro going in the background. So <laughs> well, you see. kept broadcasting. You, apparently, you kept broadcasting. So yay for Zoom technology. Back to the guests. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I think that we we had at one point interconnected our, our accounts with Zoom. So I like to say, I think it just switched over to me. I became the host for a minute and then now we're back with Jake for hosting, I think, maybe. <laughs> I am the host, yes. Okay. The host is with the mostest. Mm-hmm. Wow, well, um, okay. Yeah, Heather there in, uh, in the chat, she said she's heard uh, the protection uh, uh, Stinging nettle is a good protection in, in your yards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, any uh, any plant that has thorns or, or stings, things like that. And in, in the Ozarks, uh, we use green briar, we use blackberry canes, um, rose bushes. Uh, we also have a tree called the honey locust that grows here that makes these big thorns. I've gathered them before. That was six, seven inch long thorns on these oh trees. Oh my gosh. And uh, used to, in the old days, um, on these homesteads, there would be a lot of honey locusts and people would 
strategically planned where their fences were going so that they could incorporate the honey locust into the fence because it was a natural protection. You know, cows couldn't jump through it because of these thorns or things couldn't go over it. And so you see a lot of these homesteads, there's still all these big honey locust trees that have been preserved because they've been used in these fence rows. Um, but again, there's this outer and inner level of all of the stuff. On the outer level, it makes good fences, but on the inner level, it's 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 protective. These thorns mm -hmm. will protect you not only from physical harm, but also from all of the spiritual harm and things like that. Um, so, you know, even if you don't have a honey locust tree around, people will still cut the thorn clusters and hang them over their doors um, to protect uh, against lots of different illnesses, spirits, things like that. And then there is this uh, thing that it's done in Southern Conjure in the South, and I've seen it actually here in Washington from people who lived in the South, you know, who are from the South who moved up here. And that's the, the trees that they do when they branches of a tree and they mm -hmm. take the blue bottles, so whatever you can mm -hmm. find it, normally from the vodka bottles, and they mm -hmm. stick them in the branches of the tree and they have the conjure person come blessed with prayer. And that traps the spirits that are traveling mm -hmm. through the land mm -hmm. and uh, at night. And then when the sun comes out, the sun hits them and basically purifies them. Is that also a thing in the Osir culture? Yeah, um, so they're called bottle trees here. And mm -hmm. yeah, used to, it was dead trees. They would trim back the branches and then put bottles on them. Um, I've also seen them made out of metal, like wrought iron, um, and then you put the bottles on it. I've heard lots of explanations for it. There's There's some belief that it comes from indigenous slash West African folklore, the idea that spirits can't cross over running water. And so the light reflecting through the blue uh, reminds them of water and it keeps them from coming inside of your house. Um, I've also heard the uh, this, you know, coming in and then the sunlight purifying them um, as well. We, do really, we really don't know where they came from, um, but again, it's probably an amalgam of a lot of different traditions. Um, there's also a tradition here of egg trees and so people will take eggs and you blow out the middle and so you just have like the empty shell and they'll paint them blue sometimes or sometimes they'll use blue chicken eggs um, which are extra auspicious because of the color and they naturally occur um, and then they'll hang them up in a tree and I, I met a lady that had one of these egg trees and she kind of explained to me what was going on she said that you know you hang up these eggs and evil will get trapped in it and if one one falls off the tree and breaks, it means that, you know, it stopped this evil from getting to your house um, and it sort of absorbed it before it could get to you. Um, so no, yeah, the bottle trees and egg trees both are kind of a tradition. Um, I've also seen them um, with different colored glass of browns and greens and things like that. Um, in certain places, they've become just sort of decoration. Um, so like the, the meaning behind it has kind of been lost, but yeah, there are a few places where you can still find the old blue bottle trees. Didn't that originate with the, uh, the gullahs down in Louisiana? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so gullah culture is, uh, South Carolina, but oh, yeah, my I, bad. Okay. yeah. Um, but I have I've have heard that story too um, that mm -hmm. it originated and also um, in the south you sometimes get haint blue which is mm -hmm. a certain color that people paint their front porches um, and there uh, there is maybe some connection there but um, it's it's questionable because um, you know blue as a protective color also goes back to Greek and, and Middle Eastern folk culture where you have the the Nazar the or the Matiasmas the blue eye to protect from evil eye um, mm -hmm. and so yeah it's one of those things it's hard to figure out who influenced who but I mean I take it as, you know, it's interesting to look deeper into this, this stuff, but we also at some point have to accept that there's a certain amount of beauty in a, an amalgam tradition, you know, Absolutely. a mixture of lots of different things. And for me, I, I don't know, I guess I'm not as scared of mystery as other people are, but I'm just like, oh, there's a mystery, who knows, but it works. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you brought up that got my gears thinking as well, it's a practice that is incredibly common in Mexican brujería and curanderismo that I've also seen in Southern Conjure, and that's the egg cleanse, you know, the limpia de huevo, the cleansing of the egg. Mm -hmm. 
And we do that because eggs are living things, you know? Eggs are alive and one day there would have been people, uh, you know, there would have been a creature, a living creature had they hatched. So what we do is, is that with, in my culture, we always do it with a number two pencil for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, we make sure that it's room temperature. We write the name of the person being cleansed and we run it saying very specific prayers down the body of the person, always brushing downward. Because I work with Santa Muerte, I send my prayers to Santa Muerte and to Jesus and, you know, the whole Mexican folk magic thing. And I rub them 13 times from head to toe with the egg, saying very specific prayers. And whatever spiritual illness gets soaked up at the egg, that later gets broken up in a clear glass of holy water to be read and then disposed of. But the interesting thing is, is that I've seen my elders do this to people who were literally at death's door. And when they, when they open the egg that they literally just got out of the supermarket, like a couple of, like, like no less than a couple of hours ago, it either had a partially formed chicken in there already or blood mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or feathers that they should not have been there for a grocery store egg. And that's when they tell me, you know, that's the spirit that got eaten by the egg, that got caught into the egg. Oh, my I I don't know if, if there's anything similar in Brandon's uh, Ozark practice, but that's something else that another way of uh, folk magic dealing with spirits. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about saxophone work and spirits and all of that. You know, in folk magic, we all have our own different ways in which we deal with the spirits that are affecting the living. Yeah, uh, we do egg cleanses the same way. Um, and that's another one of those interesting cross-cultural things. Yeah, so we, uh, I, I'll take an egg and uh, I don't normally write uh, anything on the egg, but it's always named for a person. So it's connected to a person. And then uh, we normally do either three or seven times um, from head to toe on the front and on the back as well. Um, and then sometimes if you know, you're know you drawn to a certain location, you may do some more sort of like rubbing, but it's always in the downward direction. Um, it's always that's that holy number, either three or seven times. Um, and then typically um, in my own work, I, I do, I crack it into water to, to sort of read what was pulled off. Um, but the, the people that I've kind of learned from, they would just take the egg and they would have the person uh, like hold a paper towel and then put the egg on it. And then they would have them blow onto the egg and throw it against a tree. And that smashing action releases whatever was drawn out. And the tree has this natural ability to be able to take it into the earth and let the earth neutralize and rebalance and purify whatever was, was taken out. Um, so yeah, we use eggs um, not just for people, but I've used eggs um, as a part of you know cleansing a house or exorcism stuff. Um, to to draw those energies into an object and then be able to take the object out of the house. Um, there's one tradition. We like to use a lot of organic containers. So eggs are very easy because traditionally Ozarkers would have chickens, but we also use potatoes. Um, onions are onions are particularly good for spirit work um, because the, the, the hotness, the heat of the onion is able to draw out specifically evil spirits and like demons and fiery spirits and things like that. Um, but you will take that and then, you know, whatever your, your spirits you're getting out of the house, you'll, you'll do a ritual to, to draw them into this object. And then you'll take that and bury it in a cemetery and you'll lay the spirits there. Um, the cemetery being this gateway into the other world. So you're actually physically taking them from a location and rehoming them in the, the other world uh, by way of the graveyard or the cemetery. It's incredibly interesting. We learned so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is one of my oldest memories. I have this memory of being a tiny, tiny, tiny little kid that I don't even remember how old I was. And my, my grandmother, Mama Tacha, was teaching all of the teenagers how to do a basic egg cleanse. And at the end of it, we had to take the egg and throw it at the roots of one of the trees in her backyard so that the, the roots will take it and earthen it and ground it, as we say in, in Wicca. And I remember being a little kid, I'm just going, mm. 
and it dropped right in front of me and breaking mm-hmm. that bawling us a little baby saying it didn't do it because it didn't <laughs> hit the tree so oh, my no. grandmother gave me a whole new egg and i ran right next to the tree and i went mm. So that's, one of, <laughs> that's one of my favorite childhood memories is not not being strong enough to throw it into the tree and just having to walk literally next to the tree on the way but yeah it's it's an interesting cross-cultural practice mm. yes um, and it's interesting one of the things that i learned from my elders particularly mama star she has a story about uh how in some some works you have to be very careful what you dispose of the egg because if you do it over and over and over and over in the same direction, the earth itself becomes saturated mm-hmm. with the nature of the illnesses you're disposing there. And somebody walking back and just pick it up and get sick. Mm-hmm. You know, that goes back to the energy of respecting the earth that you work with and mm-hmm. respecting the land and the spirits that live there and make sure that you do not uh, overstay your welcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to use um, running bodies of water, rivers and creeks, um, because there's that constant moving action um, that whatever you dispose of there. So if it's an egg, we'll, instead of smashing it against a tree, we we can sometimes go out and throw it into the river. And that that movement, nothing can stay in one place. It always moves on. And so you have that cleansing action of the water. Um, but yeah, I, I lived at a place once where I had an egg tree that, you know, we were always throwing eggs against this tree and the tree died. Uh, it was a healthy tree and it 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 died so we backed off and it actually came back um but part of it was still dead it was a split sort of branch tree and half of it was dead and half of it was alive and it was kind of a spooky reminder of the you know how our actions as practitioners as healers as witches or whatever you know it has a, an effect on the world around us even when we aren't necessarily thinking that it does um and so yeah i have a uh, a few different egg trees around my property that i use um instead of just one tree now but i i do like the action of uh the moving water um sometimes we'll just crack an egg into a glass and then put it down the toilet um because that's the easiest form of <laughs> running water you can find perfect um, perfect. <laughs> and so you can actually crush up the shell and the inside and flush it all um and then the sewer will take it away so we do that a lot in, in curanderismo in the United States, flush mm-hmm. down the toilet. But it's interesting talking about running water or natural bodies of water. In core shamanism, that's one of the things that you get taught is, is that when you're doing a shamanic extraction, when you're removing illness from someone, uh, one of the ways that you know is, is that when you're in a shamanic state of consciousness, when you're in trance, looking at the soul of the person who needs healing, a lot of the times you will see that they're covered in bugs and the bugs are a sign of illness. And part of the, the healing that we do is taking the bugs, merge with the spirit. So the spirit that we're working with takes the bugs, grabs them, and throws them into the nearest body of water. You know, and when they get into the water, the water has natural bodies of water in particular, have this natural tendency of neutralizing illness including nature spirits who don't belong somewhere who are being harmful. So when we throw them in the water, they become a part of nature again and they just become neutralized. They're no longer harmful. So I'm so glad to live near the ocean because when I have clients in my work or I need to do something for a friend at home, I just throw it into the Puget Sound and I'm like, done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here we have, a lot of waterways in the Ozarks, uh, lots of springs and creeks and all of this. And so you're you're never uh, even a mile away from uh, a creek at any given time. There's there's Mm -hmm. everywhere. So we have a lot of them, but I I still use the toilet if I can't get out to (laughs) to a river. but yeah, river is, I mean, that that purifying action is a big part of Ozark folk healing. a lot of what we do both physically and also for spirits is is determined elementally and so um, based upon the divinations that we do if uh, depending on where something is located in the body it gives it the correspondence of a certain element and then if we want to counter that we we use the opposing element so uh, traditional ozark folk healing practices are very um 
very dynamic. So it's not just, you know, if you want to cleanse an illness, you do this. It's if you want to cleanse a fire illness, you take them down to the river and you wash them. If you want to cleanse a water illness, you actually have to heat them up and you have to put them next to a fire and you have to blow tobacco smoke over them and things like that. And so um, everything is very elemental, um, which is for me, I mean, it makes sense because Ozark people have been amongst the elements um, since the very beginning, you know, being out in, in the wilderness areas, uh, being close to the water and close to the wind blowing through the trees and the earth. Um, and so water is, is definitely one of the big cleanses, um, but there are other elemental ones as well. And uh, when we rebalance certain spirits, land spirits, um, we sort of do divination to identify the spirit with a certain element to be able to counter that spirit or to be able to build up the spirit if it's a weak spirit, um, depending on, you know, what element we might find. Sounds like a balancing of the elementals. Listen, yeah, kind and, of. And in the Ozarks, everything is about, uh, Ozarkers are, are traditionally obsessed with auspiciousness and inauspiciousness. So doing everything at the right time uh, with the right alignment of the stars and the moon phases, but also the right alignment of the elements to get everything. And I always tell people, you know, it's when you're starting to, to work with this stuff, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. It really is. It's or or working out like a math equation. <laughs> you have to you have to be able to put all of the pieces in the right place at the right time um, in order for the, the situation to be the most auspicious situation possible. You know, uh, that reminds me that the local strand of curanderismo that was practiced in the area that my family in Mexico is from uh, is actually a little bit complicated that way. We have specific illnesses that are tied to the elements. And if you have, uh, for example, eating so much food that is either too hot or too cold, you get an illness that accompanies uh, that specific uh, illness, not necessarily the way you think about it, but the way... Uh, it counterbalances. So part of the of uh, traditional Mexican curanderismo is giving people food that will uh, harmonize the imbalances in their diet mm -hmm. to cure the illness. I mean, I remember uh, having this really horrible fever and uh, and 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 cold, and one of the local curanderas as a child uh, gave me a ice cube to uh, to just suck on mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. while she prayed over me. And she basically talked about a specific element that I had eaten way too much food. Uh, I think it was a specific fruit that was in season. It's hard to remember, it's a very long time ago. But as soon as I finished the ice cube, my fever had gone down and my cold was gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. There's a interesting Ozark story that one of the, the old folklorists, Franz Randolph collected um, in the first part of the 1900s, um, there was a lot of food shortages across the Ozarks. And so people were sending crates of food out to these rural areas to help supplement people's diets um, to sort of get through this time. And uh, one of the things that they were shipping out were citruses. So they were shipping out grapefruits and oranges and the Ozark people had never seen a grapefruit before, um, but they knew it was a citrus. And when they were shipping these out was during the fall and winter. And you never eat citrus in those times because it's it's cold. It's a, so raw fruit, it's a cold and you don't mm -hmm. wanna eat cold things when it's cold. And so um, this folklorist uh, collected these stories about people who were taking the grapefruits and boiling them um, to heat them up in order to, so that they weren't so cold. So they were eating hot grapefruit um, <laughs> in order to, in order to keep from getting their bodies too cold during the winter mm -hmm. by eating the citrus. So, yeah. I guess if you're starving, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, Jake, did you have any more questions? I mean, this got deep. I don't, like. I don't know if I'm qualified to even ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always tell all my students in my classes that the only silly question is the one you didn't ask. Hmm. True. True. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we, I, <laughs> but that's okay. So, if we find it silly, Jake, we'll tell you, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, I know you will for sure. <laughs> um, but so, you know, it seems like we've given a misnomer to our title about dueling psycho, uh, do the dueling mystics and psychopumps. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems it has a lot more in common than it has for differences. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I guess my, my next question is, because I simply just don't know, is we hear a lot about these practices coming from, say, the southeastern United States, um, Latin America, but outside of those areas, like I live on the West Coast, you never hear about any of this stuff. Uh, what do you think caused the regionalization? Or really, it is more widespread than we think. It's just, it might be called something else. Oh, man, Mexican curanderismo is thriving in the West Coast of the United States. Mm-hmm. It's just that for us in Mexican culture, we keep it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know. We, even if you go to a lot of Mexican botanicas, the Mexican witchcrafts and, and healing stores, we normally, when I bring my white friends there, they look at me like, what did you just do? What are they doing here? <laughs> are they going to start trouble? Are they going to say something racist? Mm-hmm. We've been treated badly for so long that when we see people from outside of the culture in our traditional religious spaces, we kind of freak out. And that is why a lot of people don't know that these practices are thriving there. Uh, however, there are similar practices all over the world. I mean, look at, for example, in, 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 um, in Europe, the, the practices uh, in Germanic countries of trolldom, you know, trolldom has a lot in common with this type of practices. Uh, it's not just necessarily the energy of dealing with with Catholicism and the energy of people who are enslaved and you know Native American work is the energy of working with what you have, working with the spirits of the land and the plants that grow there and what's in your kitchen and what what's in your farm. You know, it's it's the energy of making do with what you have. Folk magic is the magic of the people. So you're gonna find it all over the world where people just needed help making ends meet. You know, when you needed help making something happen without creating more trouble for yourself. Yeah, I I definitely agree with that. Folk magic is the magic of the people. And um, by and large, folk magic traditions are really hard to go looking for. Um, because they tend to remain amongst the folk. Yeah, they, they're within the mm-hmm. community. And at least from an Ozark perspective, Ozarkers have always been very insular. They don't tell people, you know, all of their secrets and stuff. There's a famous Ozark phrase, we always lie to strangers. And uh, it's, you know, kind of true. You know, what you see on the outside <laughs> isn't necessarily what is really happening. And so I think today there's a lot more people that are sort of opening up about traditions here. Um, And I mean, I know, you know, sort of Ozark diaspora people all over the United States that sort of have these traditions and their families. And um, it's, it's always interesting. I tell people, you know, it's a folk magic is hard to find, but guaranteed it's already in your family. Um, so, you know, home remedies and home traditions and things like that, um, probably already there. You just never even thought it was anything you, you know, just overlook it so easily. Um, but unlike other systems of magic, ceremonial magic or magic that's connected to more sort of religious traditions, folk magic tends to be in the house. It's in the family, it's in the community. And I always tell people, you know, Um, I I write about this stuff because I love writing, but by and large, you know, this stuff isn't written about because the people that are practicing this are too busy practicing it to to write anything down. And so I just happen to be in a position where I love writing about it, but I also can practice it at the same time. But that's very rare to see. Um, And so if you're ever wondering, you know, why don't I see more stuff about folk magic out there? It's because people are too busy healing their communities and healing their families mm-hmm. to, 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 to teach you about this. And it's, it's really good to have people out there that are also, you know, teaching newer generations.
means this stuff. Um, but I, I found with folk magic, that's that's one of the sort of defining features is that it it isn't in your face. It's it's not something that is um, at least from an Ozark perspective. It's not heavily ritualized. I tell people that, you know, if you go visit an Ozark healer, you probably won't even know they're doing anything. Um, they, you know, you will just be sitting with them and you may be chatting with them and they're doing all sorts of stuff behind the scenes, but you may not see any of it. Um, and that sort of simplicity that I find in a lot of other folk traditions, that's, that's where the power is, um, for me anyway, that, that, in that simplicity to be able to, just rely upon your inborn gift um, or and your connection with your own inborn power and the power of your ancestors and guides and higher powers and all this other stuff and being able to act as a conduit for that power in the world. Um, so yeah, folk magic is all around, even on the West Coast. I know for a fact, I have Ozark friends on the West Coast who are practicing this stuff too. Um, it's just sometimes hard to find. Um, you kind of have to, you have to get in good with the communities too, which people don't always like doing. Um, and that's, that's how you get to know this stuff is by being accepted by the community and being respectful and, um, asking the right people. You know, that's actually such an interesting thing, you know, uh, because it really is what it boils down to when it comes to folk magic and that's community. Mm -hmm. you know? It's the connection to your community and serving your community. And that brings me back to one of the things my grandmother, Mama Tacha, used to tell me a lot about brujería and curanderismo and Mexican styles of shamanism from the indigenous people. And that's something I take into heart because I hate to label myself. The only labels I use for myself, I, don't, I have never used them until other people started calling me that. So I just ran with it. And when my grandmother used to tell me, Roman mijo, Nobody in their right mind calls themselves a brujo. Nobody in their right mind calls themselves a curandero. Nobody in their right mind calls themselves a shaman. These are the titles that your community bestows upon you due to the services you carry to them because of the good you do for them. And that's something that taken to heart. It re I, I really just have, you know, because it's not so much about the things that uh, that we that we that the, the the status that we carry in these communities, it's really about the service that it is, and that's part of what makes these practices so uh, connected to only community because they are a path of service. You know, it is not something grandiose and huge, and you know, look at the big bad uh, healer over there who who's making millions and millions of dollars killing everybody. No, it's, it's literally something you sacrifice of yourself to be of service to the people around you. And it is by their grace that you, something good happens on your behalf uh, as a return. And it, that is the very reason why this practices, whether it's uh, the sacrament work or whether it is prayers to the saints or whether it's healing or cleansing with the spirits of the ancestors. It's, it's the reason why it's so hard to find because a lot of people who have come to our communities uh, looking for folk magic have come from the wrong perspective. I don't know how it is for Brandon, but for me, I have lost count with how many people have come to me asking me to teach them about curanderismo and brujería. And all of them come, most of them actually, not all of them, but most of them have come with the energy of teach me this powerful teaching that you have. I want to have this strength. I want to have this power. And as I told uh, uh, Wendy before, you know, mm -hmm. this is, I asked them, why do you feel powerless? And they get, excuse me, I'm not powerless. I'm strong. I'm powerful. I can kick your butt right now. And I'm like, only the truly powerless seek for power the way you're seeking it right now. Mm -hmm. In my entire life as an adult doing these practices, I've only encountered one student that came to me for the right reasons in my entire life. And I'm 42 years old, one. And that person learned what they needed to learn from me. They took it, they ran with it and they made it their own and they integrated into the energy of their own community. It amalgamated with their own practices that their community needed for them. And that's what folk magic does. But 
it's interesting because it's not only about serving community, but serving community for the right reasons. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. And I, I can, I can share with, with, you know, I can sympathize with that story too of people coming to, to learn. It, it's, I think it's the commodification of the practices too that has happened over the past, you know, 70 years or so, um, where, you know, most of the time when somebody comes and they say, you know, well, can you teach me folk magic or can you teach me Ozark? healing practices, what they mean is, can you make a kit for me to be able to take and to be able to use, um, like I'm going to the store and buying a flashlight, you know, to turn off and on and off and on. And, uh, and that's just, that's not how, that's not how this works. You know, traditionally in the Ozarks, the only people that learned this stuff or was past this stuff were people that were already identified as having been born with the gift. Um, so if you weren't born under the, the omens and the auspices of these specific omens and auspices, you would never be destined to be a healer. And there were people within the community that specifically knew what to look for when babies were born. They were usually the midwives that were pulling the babies out. They knew what to look for and they knew how to identify this. I take a little bit different approach. Um, I mean, it's based on the approach that my teachers kind of took as well that you know everybody is born with a different aptitude a different talent and so I think like you know you could be an expert painter but not know how to sculpt and it's the same sort of way with this stuff is you know I don't take the approach that you have to be born with the xyz sort of things about but I think that you you have to have a, at least a talent for it and I think that there is a talent for healing a talent for magical practices and for spirit work. And I think that what people are usually coming to me wanting is they're wanting a plan. They're wanting, uh, you know, something, uh, a sheet that they can follow and something will happen. And that unfortunately isn't the way that folk magic works all the time. Um, but from an Ozark perspective, all of this stuff always starts inside and it always starts with your relationship to god to the to the divine to your ancestors whatever you want to call it that's where it starts and then everything flows from that point and so if you want to learn folk magic then sit with yourself <laughs> you know mm -hmm. spend some time working on yourself spend some time getting in touch with that whatever you want to call it inside of yourself and then everything will kind of fall into place but i think that's the simplicity that doesn't sell very well it's not flashy it's not something you can necessarily put on you know an instagram post and so i think what happens is the folk magic traditions sort of remain in the background and the flashier stuff sort of comes to the, the front um trends gets, yeah mm -hmm. trends and, and photographed and, and stuff like that mm -hmm. but yeah i mean if i had to offer people and i'm sure there are people watching this who want who are interested in becoming practitioners of this stuff it's like you always start with yourself and you always start with your relationship to spirit to your own spirit to the spirit world or to you know this inborn power um, and then everything else comes later. But the most important thing is that connection, um, because that's the foundation of all of this stuff. That, that's where you nailed it in the head. It really, you really did. Mm -hmm. Because for those of us who have been living these traditions our entire lives, including not just folk magic, but also shamanism, you know, we did not get to the point where we're recognized by our communities for doing this work, because we've been doing it for five minutes. You know, it takes a very lengthy amount of time to build yourself a relationship with not only divinity, your own soul and your own spirit, but your ancestors and the spirits that help you do your work. And that type of relationship that you can rely on for very serious healing work takes a lifetime to build. And most people who come out of novelty to folk magic or shamanism or any type of serious uh, indigenous healing practice. Most of them don't have the dedication or the patience to build such a lengthy and reliable and strong connection. They basically want a magic wand that they can 
they can wave around and fix something or just look cool, you know? They just want a, a, a drum to bang to say, oh, look, I'm a shaman, or a rattle to rattle and say, oh, look, I'm a shaman, or, or a candle to light or some oil to rub on something and say, oh, look, I'm doing folk magic. And that's not the case, you know? The, mm-hmm. the, the candles and the oils and the roots and the plants, they carry their own spirit, their own power. You know, but if you don't have connection to divinity, if you're not connected to God and to your own soul and your ancestors and the spirits that you work with, you're missing at least a good, ch- at least a good half of the work. Because this, the, the, the items that we do our work with, be it the rattle and drum of the shaman, are just the tools that are the vehicle for our connections to spirit. Mm-hmm. And people nowadays really just don't want to make that connection. Mm-hmm. They don't. You know, they, they have been so disillusioned with traditional religious institutions that they believe that everything that is religious is evil and oppressive, where that's just not the case. You know, there is a place for divinity in the world. And if you cannot understand that, if you cannot embrace that, you're gonna have a very difficult time being a, a professional or even just a community healer, let alone a professional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as uh, that reminded me, one of my teachers gave me a phrase that has now become, I say it almost every class I teach is, and it's really the, the foundation of Ozark folk practice. She told me, I was talking to her one day about her tools and you know what types of spoons she used to stir her medicines and, and things like that. And she just stopped me and she said, as a healer, you should be able to do everything you need to do in a completely empty jail cell. And that has always sort of stuck in me, this idea of you should be able to, at the heart of this practice is the connection to that, that divinity, to that inborn spirit. That's where that power comes from. And so you should be able to do that no matter what you have around you. And I think that that has been the power of folk magic for a very long time is, folk, you know, folk magicians have been able to, you know, somebody in your community needs healing, you go over and you grab the broom off your wall and you go and you sweep them clean of their illness, um, or you use eggs or you use, you know, the things that are around you. And that's the real power that's of, of these practices is being able to use whatever is at hand. And if nothing is at hand, then you have your voice. And if you don't have your voice, you have your thoughts that can go out and can heal as well. And I think that that's one of the, the power, the real heart of the power of folk magic. Um, and I think it's one of the things that isn't easily expressible to people that are just maybe looking for the stuff of folk magic the the tools and the ingredients and things like that um that connection to that whatever you want to call it that heart of the power um i i like to call it the flow uh, you know connecting to that flow um that's hard to teach um and that's where you know people have a talent to connect to that um and but unfortunately it's not something that can necessarily be commodified and and, and sold that's why my grandmother, when I was a little boy, that's the first thing she taught me. She taught me how to pray. Mm-hmm. She sat me in her lap and every day, every night before bed, I would pray the rosary with her. Mm-hmm. You know, and she always taught me, you know, don't, mm-hmm. don't fall into the trap of the, fa- of, the, of the trendy people, you know. Don't go for the candles, don't go for the oils, don't go for the, for, for the herbs. If you have nothing else, you have God. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I think we have another question, don't we? We do. Um... See, let me scoot that over a tad. Um, from Melissa, uh, for a complete neophyte, what beginner at home methods can be used for the spirituality, spiritually drained feeling some experience after paranormal investigations, despite uh, some basic pre function protections? I'm going to start this one. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we did a, a show about this, which is cleansing work, right? I think so. So mm-hmm. part of it, if you want to learn my way, go back into mm-hmm. the archives and, and, and look at the Mystic Moon Cafe radio show that we did on spiritual cleansing. Mm-hmm. But the number one thing that I do after doing this kind of work is 
cleansing my energy, making sure that my energy is nice and clean, and that I am disconnected from the places and entities that I've been working with, that I come back to come back to normal. Uh, if you want to do that very easily, take a detox bath, okay? Uh, a little bit of uh, sea salt, baking soda and Epsom salt into your bathtub with some, uh, uh, maybe some essential oils that are safe for you because not all of them are safe for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to smell nice or some bubble bath or whatever, you just take a bath. And I remember how Brandon and I were describing the egg thing, you know, that we always brush downward. Mm -hmm. When we're cleansing our energy, we always wash downward, okay? okay? Always wash downward, praying that divinity, the divinity to cleanse away all of this like tired, icky feeling energy that we have clung to. Because a lot of the time, it's not just that the spirits that we're doing or uh, working with or investigating or whatever we're doing are draining us. It's also that we're picking up the negativity and that becomes a drain on its own. So for me, the first thing I do when I start feeling that way is take a cleansing bath. I do mine with uh, herbs as well. I make a tea out of, uh, let's see, is uh, rosemary, basil, and hyssop, and I put okay. it into the tub and, and and wash with that as well. I call it my holy trinity I roll back. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and um, you uh, um, you just uh, you just need to do something to make you feel clean again. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you ever been cleaning your house all day and you're sweaty and sticky and nasty, and you took either a really good bath or a really good shower that you got out of it and you went, oh my God, I needed that. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. Do something that makes you have that feeling. That's what I do. I'm, I'm curious. So, so if a person doesn't have a, a bathtub or, or you know the ability to, to do a bath, but in the shower, could you add the herbs and essential oils to say your soap and then Cleanse there are people. Away. There are people in in the conjure community who sell soaps. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I do, what I uh, recommend, also my 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 uh, my students to do when they say mm -hmm. I don't have a shower, a bathtub, or I'm too big to fit in the bathtub, which some of us are now, <laughs> 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 is is that I recommend to them to make the mixture of the sea salt, Epsom salt, baking soda, oils, and herb and an herb and herb and, and the herb tea, and mm -hmm. put it in a bucket of cold water, okay? And after you okay. wash yourself clean in the shower, mm -hmm. dump the bucket of cold water over your head and do one last wash. Oh, sweet, okay. Because that's something that hot water can cleanse you physically, but mm -hmm. oh my God, cold water will cleanse the living hell out of your soul, pardon the pun. Interesting. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would recommend the same exact method. Uh, I, I mean, we do baths, spiritual baths in Ozark folk practice too. Typically, we don't do um, so sitting in the bath. Uh, we typically, so Ozarkers tend to like running water. Um, so if you can't go out to a creek and lay in the creek or dunk yourself under the water in the creek, mm -hmm. um, I always recommend getting, uh, you know, going to the store and getting a plastic tea pitcher, like an iced tea pitcher and mm -hmm. um, putting your herbs and or just salt and water um, in that. And then three times over your head while you're facing the east. Um, and then I usually tell people you can, you can recite some of the psalms if you want or you can just recite you know whatever is washed off let it be cleansed off whatever is washed off let it be cleansed off and so you do that three times and by the third time all of the water should be gone and um yeah I, I think that that's a great method. Um, I mean, that's the method that I use. If I go into a place and I feel gross afterwards, um, mm -hmm. I always come back. And the first thing I do is I take a bucket bath and let it just sort of all wash off. Um, and then the only other thing that I would recommend also is, especially if you've encountered any sort of heavy energies, um, do something that is fun afterwards. So take a cleansing bath, and then do something that you enjoy doing to lighten the energy, um, to energize you. So if you like going bowling, cleanse within the bath, you know, say your prayers, do some meditation and then go bowling and have that sort of firm, energetic separation between that sort of heavy energy and then this light energy that's coming in. Um, but yeah, I always recommend cleansing baths 
uh, on a weekly basis, daily basis, even if you're not going to haunted places, just the energies that you pick up being in the world, um, having uh, a weekly cleansing ceremony sort of uh, on a schedule is always nice, I think. That's good maintenance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then another thing with the Clinton baths, I don't know how it's in Osorg magic, but in Curanderismo and in Conjure both, uh, we are dry. We never mm-hmm. towel dry. We we'll always, I always tell my clients, you know, when you do Clinton bath, um, mm-hmm. you can even put your bathrobe on if you want, you know, so you don't catch a cold. But mm-hmm. you're dry. And it's interesting talking about doing something fun. Uh, there's this tradition in Japanese Shinto. Uh, in Shintoism, when the, there's this village in Japan, and you'll you Google it and you'll see it, uh, where the, the people there on the day of the Lunar New Year every year, the entire clan gets together and they force themselves to laugh so much that they feel so silly that they start laughing for real. And that's the way they banish all of the horrible things that have happened the year before. So there's a lot of power in laughter. So that's another thing to do when you feel the negativity seeping in from your day of work as a spiritual person, watch a funny movie on TV Mm -hmm. and -hmm. just laugh your ass off. And you'll be surprised how healing that can be. That's why our shows are so fun. We we keep the laughter going and and that helps raise spirits, I think. And I don't know why I've disappeared. (laughs) You've blended into the background. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You've become a ghost. Ooh, not yet. Um, just this reminded me talking about cleanses specifically for like spirits and stuff like that. Um, in the Ozarks, there's one plant that is very traditionally used in the Ozarks for detaching spiritual influences through bathing. Um, and so it's never burned as a smoke. It's always mixed with water and used. And it's one that you can grow really easily in most places in the country. So the the genus is Monarda, M-O-N. A-R-D-A, um, but some people know it by lemon bee balm or crimson bee balm. It's a, it's a really good pollinator plant, um, and there's, I think, 20, 30 different varieties. I really like uh, wild bergamot or lemon bee balm. Both of those are really good, and these grow native here in the Ozarks. They, they grow all over the place. They're called horse mint here, Um, And this plant in particular, for whatever reason, has traditionally been used in baths for detaching spiritual influences. So traditionally, um, and I've met some old timers that still swear by this, if they go to the the cemetery for anything, if you're going to visit grave sites or whatever, when you get home, you always take a bath with Monarda, with horse mint, um, Mm -hmm. so that anything that you brought back would be detached from you then. Um, But you can even mix up this as a tea and use it in a house um, to detach spiritual influences. So you can wash the walls or the doorways or the mirrors um, or the floors with, with horse mint. Um, so yeah, if you are somebody that has a green thumb and likes growing plants, look into the Monardas. You can buy the seeds really easily and um, it makes a really good spiritual cleansing bath. Nice, very nice. Would, do those come back every year or mm-hmm. is that a yeah, oh yeah okay and they mm-hmm. they spread every year they're in the mint mm-hmm. family so that, that's um, what i thought so yeah and that yeah. definitely comes back so yeah in my yard i have a nice little sunny spot by a fence and so i have a big patch of wild bergamot that i just let take over and then you know i use it in baths a lot mm-hmm. wendy yes i think our time is running low I think our time is running low. I, and if, if you want, you can send good thoughts. I've, I've got to give the, my one little client doggy. Oh, yeah. um, she's got uh, epilepsy and she just recently mm-hmm. had to go on to the, the lithium because oh. the frequency is, is increasing. And she just came over to tell me that it's almost nine o'clock and, <laughs> and it's time. It was wonderful so, chatting with y'all. Oh, it's been yeah, fantastic. Likewise. Yeah, very fun. Very fun. Thank you for coming on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Wendy, we, first off, Roman, Brandon, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? My website, www.teotonali.com, mm-hmm. has a contact me form that goes straight to my phone. 
just make sure you write your uh, email address so I can talk to you back properly. Mm -hmm. Because I get way too many people that misspell their own email addresses, and now I can talk to them when they send me messages. <laughs> yeah, and I have a website, ozarkhealing.com, um, O-Z-A-R-K, healing.com. And I also have a contact form on there. And yes, please spell your email address correctly, because that's also something I deal with <laughs> a lot, uh, because we want to get back in touch with you. And uh, if you don't put your email address in there, we can't. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Alexa, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope you come back and do this some more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sounds Thank fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks, right. folks. Um, I, you know, this was a special occasion, Mystic Moon. I'm not sure the next time we're going, going to uh, have another live episode for you, but uh, yes. we will keep you informed if we do. And I will have this up on uh, YouTube and our Spreaker podcast. Uh, you can find it anywhere in Mystic Moon Cafe, and you can watch the watch or listen to the to the replay. So, guys, once again, thank you. Um, hope you all have a wonderful summer and continue on with your classes and and the the ones you're teaching. Not you know, and and we're always learning. So that's a good thing as well. And. All right. Well, I right. guess that's it then. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. Take care. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Yay. We're off stream. Thank you. Yay.